So, the planet, five billion years ago, a lonely rock in space. It took three billion years to create a geosphere. And then one billion years later, we had humans coming on Earth, and they created a technosphere that you see on the right corner. The technosphere is actually a sign of all human activities. But actually, when we mix this together, this is our planet right now. And we're coming to a planetary ceiling, it's called, uh, because every sphere was feeding on the previous sphere. Like the biosphere was feeding on the previous sphere, and the technosphere, like think of, of the oil reserves, for example, was feeding on this biosphere. And it's now coming to uh, this planetary ceiling, where uh, we are getting into a, a conflict. Many of the presentations this morning were about this conflict of technology and humanity. But we as humans, actually, we love technology. Uh, we have it all around us. Uh, it makes us very connected. We're connected 24 hours a day. We have unlimited resources of information. Um, and here's a slide that Steve Jobs had on his uh, uh, keynote in 2011, where he was saying that technology uh, alone was not enough for innovation. It needed to connect with, with art. And uh, this is actually what this talk will be about. Uh, it's this cross point of art and science. Um, because it's, you know, all this technological improvement, uh, it's making us smarter and everything. We have all this information, it connects us. But there is also a downside, which uh, has been extensively discussed this morning, uh, when we talked about artificial intelligence, the first keynote this morning. Um, this downside is, uh, is affecting us on many levels. Uh, think about our privacy, or the way we fight wars. Uh, there's not one man fighting another, but it's actually autonomous machines. Um, and then below, you see the mosquito. Uh, it's actually the biggest enemy of human mankind, killed already billions of people. Um, and there are big questions about this little animal, like, can we erase it? Of course we can, with technology or with genetic manipulation, but who are we to edit this nature? So we come a bit in this time of, uh, you know, it's, it's getting uh, uh, pretty freaky, um, the way technology is controlling us. Um, and personally, I think, when we look at the world, it has been the past 50 years, uh, one of the greatest values uh, seemed to be uh, a very economical one. Capitalism um, uh, was in need of a lot of resources. I personally think that our greatest values for human mankind are more in the field of science and culture uh, and creativity, and creativity not to boost, again, this economy, but to boost human evolution. Um, and I think this science and this culture, they cannot, they have to be together, because science is giving us the facts and culture is giving us the values. Um, yeah, so this relationship between science and art, um, science and art, they naturally overlap. Uh, both are means of investigations. Both involve ideas, theories and hypotheses. They are tested in places where mind and hand come together, like the lab and the studio. Uh, artists and scientists both study materials, uh, people, culture, history, religion, mythology, and they learn to transform information into something else. In ancient Greece, the word art was techne, um, from which technique and technology are derived, actually. Uh, terms that are applied to both scientific and, and artistic practice. Um, traditionally, art and science have been treated as, uh, as two separate disciplines. Um, but when they are studied together, it's clear to see the impact that one has on the other. A great deal of creativity is required to make scientific great breakthrough, and art is just as often an expression or a product of scientific knowledge. Consider the science behind mixing paint in the correct proportion, or creating perspective in drawings, or even imagining the dance of a quark. Visual arts has been used to document the natural world for thousands of years, from cave drawings of animals that helps today's researchers figure out yesterday's fauna, 
to paintings of century-old experiments that shows us how they were con conducted. Um, one of the most famous examples of this interconnection between art and science is the work of the Renaissance master Leonardo da Vinci. I have a quote from, here, from him here in the back. While his uh, Mona Lisa is probably the most famous portrait ever painted, da Vinci's scientific drawings are smaller in scale and intensely detailed and annotated. And they demonstrate that he was not less skilled as an inventor and researcher. In fact, da Vinci's talent as a bridge engineer was proven in 2001, um, when the artist Vebjorn Sand built the da Vinci Brun Bridge in Norway, using the artist's never-realized plans for a bridge meant to, to stretch across the Golden Horn in Istanbul, back then probably Constantinople. He was, this was rejected as an architectural impossibility, by Ottoman Sultan, who commissioned it. The bridge was built 500 years after da Vinci designed it, proving the Sultan was wrong. Many of examples of art intersecting with science exist around us, and many examples illustrate how art is crucial in helping us understand our scientific legacy, and how science is well served by applying an artistic lens. Together, art and science help us to interpret, study and explore the world around us. Um, and it is now my pleasure to invite on stage uh, Dimitri Gelfand and Evelina Dominic. Please come on stage. Um, they just performed here right before. Uh, Dimitri and Evelina create sensory immersion environments that merge physics, mm -hmm. chemistry and computer science with uncanny philosophical practices. Current findings, particularly regarding wave phenomena, are employed by the artists to investigate questions of perception and perpetuity. Such investigations are salient because the scientific picture of the world, which serves as a basis for contemporary thoughts, still cannot encompass the unrecordable workings of consciousness. In order to engage such ephemeral processes, the duo has collaborated with new, numerous scientific research facilities, such as the European Space Agency and many others. Um, I will now give the floor to Evelina and Dimitri for a short presentation, and then we will discuss a bit this cross point of art and science and probably have some questions with you. I pass it on to you. Thank you. Thank you, Olaf, for this uh, great introduction. And we are immensely happy to be here at Sonar and also to be back uh, in Istanbul. And uh, yes, it's a great pleasure to be part of this event questioning uh, things on the border of music, entertainment, technology, and art. About 20 years ago, when Evelina and I began our artistic endeavors, uh, we established a series of constraints, and one of the most important of which has to do with a rejection of uh, solid-state matter. We decided that art had for far too long been obsessed with the illusion of permanence solidity and fixity. Uh, one of the early examples of uh, our work which uh, deeply embraces this um, escape from uh, the age-old traditions of art is a piece called Camera Lucida Sanochemical Observatory. Coincidentally, we showed this installation here in Istanbul back in 2009 at uh, an establishment called Central Istanbul. Uh, Camera Lucida employs a very uh, exotic phenomenon called sonoluminescence. Although it is um, uh, present in the natural world, it is caused by mantis shrimp, 
by a very exotic uh, and evolved creature that has the most sophisticated vision in the whole animal kingdom. Uh, nonetheless, sonoluminescence was discovered by chance in a German lab in 1930s when scientists were working with ultrasound and in the room next door they had some photo developing going on and they saw these bursts of light on these uh, photographic plates that came out of nowhere. They started to check what happened and they realized that these bursts of light on photo on photographic plates were caused by ultrasound collapsing tiny bubbles of air in the photodeveloping liquid and emitting light that later on turned out to be in ultraviolet spectrum. So ultraviolet spectrum is extremely high frequencies of light usually produced on stars. And sound is even ultrasound, which is slightly beyond our hearing frequency and many animals do hear and produce ultrasound. So ultrasound comparing in intensity and uh, frequency and wavelengths is incomparable with ultraviolet light. So in, later on in the uh, 90s and 80s this sonoluminescence was wildly researched by the army uh, because some scientists hypothesized that it could be means to cold fusion, to nuclear fusion, because to get such high energy out of such low energy is kind of amazing, and they called this phenomenon a star in a jar. We were interested in sonar luminescence because we wanted to um, see sound three-dimensionally, to to see sound how it moves in space and not as a kind of plotting or uh, approximation or mathematical model, but as a real physical process. Yeah, to this day, coincidentally, uh, there is no full explanation for sound luminescence. It takes place very, very quickly. Uh, the bubbles themselves, uh, in essentially, uh, in the case of this installation, these are bubbles of air in distilled water. They collapse uh, at over uh, four times the speed of sound. And the emission of light takes place for much less than a billionth of a second. And that's what makes it very difficult to study. But um, there are many theories out there from uh, collision-induced radiation to quantum radiation to um, quantum optical heating to plasma core ionization. Uh, of course, as Evelina had mentioned earlier, as fascinated as we are by the science, the, the, the most compelling aspect for us is the ability to walk into a completely black space, a space where you can't even see your hands in front of your face. You don't even realize that uh, this phenomenon is taking place inside of a liquid. You see fields of light which take the shape of sound waves which look very different from the way that they are described in any kind of physics books because you get to see vortices and uh, turbulent phenomena that are uh, quite unlike our, anything that we could possibly anticipate. Yes, so sound does not look like uh, sine waves. So, after all of the um, fuss about sound luminescence in the, the 90s and in the early 2000s, when it, it was a possible uh, candidate for um, nuclear fusion, as it was being called at the time, bubble fusion, and all of the uh, investments uh, in this research um, disappeared, and. Only a few renegades like ourselves and like our cohort uh, Shinichi Hatanaka back at the uh, University of Tokyo uh, continued his experiments. And here we see before us um, a recent discovery of his from just a few years back, two-colored sound luminescence. This takes place in um, nearly pure sulfuric acid infused with xenon gas. and. Um, Unfortunately, it is uh, too, too dangerous, at least too dangerous at the moment, for us to be able to disguise it in an installation. 
but uh, yeah, because unfortunately the fumes from uh, sulfuric acid would cause your lungs to burn. But uh, it's quite extraordinary the way in which the, uh, the, the bluish tonalities and the orange ones occupy different parts of the uh, sound spectrum. Yes, of the acoustic uh, pressure space. So we, um, yes, and uh, of course our interest in this wave, uh, wave phenomena, the, the way the world uh, as um, envisioned by the 20th century science consisting of fields and uh, particles and spinning uh, entities with huge energy moving at high speeds is very counterintuitive to our everyday experience. So we, we wanted to bring it uh, to the viewers as non-mediated sensory experience. And um, we were always interested in phenomena such as synesthesia that uh, are reality for a few people among us and probably, according to some research, to very small children, to babies, before their perception is separated into different sensory capacities. And here you see a cover of a very brilliant book uh, on synesthetic um, perceptions and cross-modality in uh, where, for example, visual and um, aud auditory and other senses are connected both physiologically or artistically and the, we are quite honored that the, an image of Camera Lucida is on the cover of this book and uh, we, we are not only interested in uh, works with acoustics and sound we are interested in a more broader physical picture of the world where such questions as what is time, what is space, what is matter and energy are very pertinent. But for this presentation we decided, because we are at Sonar, we decided to talk about our works that deal with this cross-modal perception of sound, where you can also perceive sound tangibly, tactilely and visually. So for those of you that uh, attended the performance, um, here, as in Camera Lucida, uh, the environment is activated by uh, high-frequency sound, not, not quite, quite as high as in, uh, as, as in the case of this, the sound of luminescence that we uh, observed earlier. And we also refocus our attention from bubbles to anti-bubbles, if you will, instead of uh, spheres of gas surrounded by liquid. Here we uh, are observing droplets, spheres of liquid surrounded by gas, levitated by sound waves. Little did we know when we uh, commenced this uh, endeavor that it's a very powerful, what is known as a hydrodynamic analog of all kinds of totally intangible uh, phenomena, both on a subatomic as well as uh, celestial scale. So, um, strangely enough, the kind of sectorial oscillations that, that you saw in the performance uh, we can look at an image of that. Yeah, un unfortunately, during the, the video feed, the live video feed, so you, you see it on the photograph. Can you go to yeah. the previous photograph? Sure. Yeah, so here you can see very well this triangular shape, and sometimes it will be in this mode where the droplet will look like a hexagon or this kind of hexagonal flower. So this, was, this is not a video still. This was taken with a very fast, camera so you can see the shape very well. During the performance you were able to see this kind of morphing shapes but that's exactly the moment when the droplet was going through sectorial oscillations and that only happens when the force of gravity is, is uh, very delicately counterbalanced with the force of acoustic pressure. 
acting in the opposite direction. And at this very moment, a droplet goes into its own mode oscillation, like every celestial body, for example, the sun, has this oscillation, this waves going through its surface, and this um, self-wave, self-oscillation has to do with the size, the mass, the density of the object, with, their, with its physical characteristics. And uh, in case of a water droplet, it has to also to do with surface tension, with you know, the molecular properties of water. And we've, we have always been fascinated with uh, microgravity, with levitation, because, of course, gravity on our planet that completely forms the way we see things, the way we imagine cardinal dimensions, uh, so much determines the way we see the world, but gravity on our planet is a very local phenomena. Uh, a, a much more general cosmic phenomena is levitation, all things float in space. And we have a, a, a series of works where we levitate things in order to bring ourselves and the viewer into this state of levitation when we observe the bodies that are in this free state. Uh, and uh, so this work is not only about acoustics, also we achieve levitation with the means of acoustics, which is quite nice because you also can do it as a sonic performance. And by hearing the change, the modulation of the frequency, you can also figure out the, the, the physical aspects of what is happening in front of your eyes. But it is also about this analogs to how bodies behave in space, where uh, gravity acts very differently than here on the surface of our planet. So speaking of gravity, uh, we uh, were very fortunate to have collaborated um, in 2016 with uh, the Nobel Prize winners in physics of that year, the, the LIGO group. Uh, LIGO stands for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. It's, um, it's a humongous scientific project on the scale of CERN that has been developed in the United States uh, by a group of international scientists for the last 50 years. It's a multi-billion project, but uh, what they achieved after enormous work of thousands of scientists, technologists, and in a way it's a huge feat of technology, but what they managed to do in 2016, and that was hailed as one of the greatest discoveries, scientific discoveries of the 21st century, they managed to detect a collision of two black holes by detecting the ripples in space-time itself. The very first time the gravitational waves were, were detected, which and were hypothesized by Einstein back at the beginning of the 20th century, but even Einstein himself believed that they would never be detectable. Yes, so in fact it was the first detection or kind of uh, tracing of a black hole because a black hole is another theoretical, hypothetical object. So, uh, as a consequence of uh, our, our residency at LIGO, we created uh, two uh, artworks, <coughs> both of which are hydrodynamic uh, analogs of black holes. And the connection with sound uh, is very interesting in the case of this work because the detection actually, the scientists call it a chirp and it was detected in the audible spectrum. Of course it has to do with a very complex technology and this 40 kilogram mirrors that reflect lasers in this four kilometer tunnel that is completely evacuated. So I really encourage you to look at the design of LIGO because it's one of the most mind-blowing pieces of technology that exists today on our planet, able to measure distances that are 10,000 times smaller than the size of a proton. So uh, 
we received the sound of the detection, but also the sounds of the LIGO itself, because they made very uh, intricate recordings of quantum fluctuations that arise in total vacuum. And also these four <coughs> kilometer tunnels, they are very, uh, they are sort of like acoustic resonant chambers, and they have to subtract all of these vibrations, all of this noise, all of the seismic noise, to be sure that what they detect is really the ripples in space-time and not something else. And somehow all this was uh, as the end presentation in this kind of sonic domain, and we uh, invited William Basinski to create a sound composition uh, with all these sounds from LIGO, with the sound detection sound of the collision of two black holes to accompany these fluid dynamic analogs of two connected entangled black holes, the video of which we will show you, unless you want to add a few things about well, yeah, before we watch the video, about I just... About wormholes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, yeah, the, 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 the second piece indeed has to do with wormholes. Uh, it has to do with the fact that um, there's a recent theory uh, posited uh, by uh, Juan Maldacena and Leonard Susskind that wormholes, a kind of cosmic string, if you will, connecting two black holes, is actually a uh, macroscopic manifestation of quantum entanglement and um, the artwork that we created called ER equals EPR. Which is a very geeky reference to two science papers, both co-authored by Einstein and Rosen. So these letters, they stand for the first letters of the names of scientists. So one paper is EPR paper, a very famous scientific paper uh, talking about phenomenon of entanglement, and ER paper by Einstein and Rosen talks about Einstein-Rosen bridges that later were called wormholes or this kind of strange folds in space-time that connect objects in space that communicate that can communicate faster than the speed of light. So Einstein himself didn't like these ideas, although they followed from mass and from his theories he considered them to be nonsense. And it's quite amazing that today, in what is in science called the second quantum revolution, the experiments that Einstein did as mental experiments, as thought experiments, are actually performed in labs with real particles, with lasers, and in experiments like LIGO. Experiments upon which uh the future of uh, quantum computing uh, relies. So now we're, we're going to uh, end with a, a video documentation of, of this piece, uh, which was uh, premiered recently in Berlin at the uh, Martin Gropius Bau.
quite magical, what you're showing us. Um, in my introduction, I was saying that um, science and art for centuries were treated very separate. Um, and in the past, let's say, 25 years, uh, it seems that science and art finally are coming together. Um, it seems like you get a lot of knowledge from the scientific field. Um, uh, and you work a lot with scientists, professors, researchers at different institutes. Um, do you think bringing art and creativity inside these institutes um, gives a new value? How do, you, how do scientists react on working with you? I think that scientists come in, in many, if not more, uh, diverse flavors than, than artists. And some of them are artists themselves and musicians. Um, at times, it has been very challenging and almost impossible, especially in, in the early years. I remember in the late 90s when uh, we invaded the so-called ivory towers, uh, we were uh, almost shunned. But uh, in recent years, especially with uh, younger generations of uh, scientific researchers, and uh, in general, a, a kind of changing climate in terms of uh, cross-disciplinary research. Um, we find that it has become easier and easier, and uh, we definitely feel as though we receive um, uh, no less uh, of a creative impulse than do our uh, scientific uh, cohorts. And uh, perhaps one of the best examples of it, uh, in order to cite uh, one, of, one of the pieces that we discussed, uh, when one of our uh, collaborators, one of the big experts in uh, sonoluminescence, Kyuichi Yasui in, in Japan, saw the final version of Camera Lucida, something that we had worked on for uh, about five years, uh, he, he, he wrote a paper that... Uh, in theoretical physics. Yeah. Mm that uh, w would not have been possible if, if he had not seen uh, these dynamics on a, the scale that uh, was just of a totally different uh, order of magnitude than what uh, most of the sonochemists and physicists that were looking at, at, at uh, sonoluminescence had uh, seen prior. They, they were looking in, into a tiny cuvette with just a single uh, imploding bubble. And, and here, it was uh, 60 liters of, of, of water with uh, all kinds of uh, totally uncharted uh, scientific territory. Do you feel science is opening up, maybe, to a more multidisciplinary approach? Well, science has went through such an incredible transformation in the last 200 years. 200 years ago, science was like an art practiced by very enlightened individuals who had the money to set up their own lab, and their labs, uh, they were filled with artifacts that are like artworks. And if you look at their beautiful scientific experiment, it's almost like an art installation. Mm -hmm. So from this kind of, of a very aesthetic, artistic uh, pursuit that was very much tuned to human senses and observing certain phenomena, in the 20th century, science transformed into industrial complex that mostly works for military and now pharmaceutical industry and economically for, driven uh, for us um, and other ugly and, uh, yeah, domains and <laughs> really um, dependent on f financing and so, uh, things like that however uh, for me as a person educated in philosophy where philosophy practiced by people 5,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, it, it was called natural philosophy. So it was sort of a uh, blend of physics, cosmology, and having this broader perspective on the universe and seeing patterns in nature, understanding things, actually a highly spiritual pursuit. Coincidentally, so, in Dutch, I'm very sorry to interrupt, I just <laughs> wanted to, to mention, it, the uh, physics is still called natural philosophy, naturkunde. Yes. So, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> books in physics were called natural philosophy, textbooks in physics in the 19th century. So, uh, 
Uh, and for me, the greatest value of science, it's an incredible tool for developing a human being. For de it's, it's the best value of science because it's extremely challenging to be a scientist. You have to submit to very rigorous mental discipline and follow it. And after you start following it, there is no way of going back. And uh, but it is it could be extremely productive. It's sort of like cellular automata. The further you go, the more interesting things you discover. But you have to be extremely rigorous in what you're doing. You cannot change your mind every day. And uh, this kind of practices uh, for developing human mind are, this is the best value of science. It's not so much the facts that we just develop the technology. It's all great. It's this kind of added benefits. Mm -hmm. And what is very important today with science and the younger generation of scientists that they also ask these questions uh, the ethical dimension of science, the social dimension of science, because in history there were these episodes when certain scientists refused to work on atomic bombs, refused to give their knowledge to distractive goals, and some scientists such as, uh, for example, von Neumann, who developed the whole uh, computer architecture that we're still using, he was very happy to develop the atomic bomb and to end up with Germans and fascism he, he, because his family suffered from uh, the Jewish genocides, genocide. So this kind of human motivations in science, you cannot take them out. And we, we have to decide these questions. We have to ask these ethical questions in, uh, as part of science, although before, the pursuit of science was still so fragile that these questions were put away, but it's no longer possible. But is that the role of the scientist to mm. ask the ethical questions, or should so the scientist that's just... what the scientist said, that it's not our place <laughs> to decide these questions. This is, their play, this is the role of society. Everyone has to decide these questions, but you cannot ask from a person who has no knowledge of science and their uh, depths of this knowledge and the consequences to to decide such questions. They are just not ready and neither do politicians because they are really not into science and um, that's why I think it is very important for artists, for other people to take interest in what uh, where the real creation the of, of knowledge of our civilization is happening today. Yeah, it does fall on the shoulders of, of, of scientists as much as it falls on the shoulders of, of, of artists. Uh, I mean, it should fall on the shoulders of philosophers, most of whom are totally illiterate in the science. And so, it, at the end of the day, there, there's no escape from ethical questions. <laughs> so what, what comes up um, actually constantly while talking to you, um, I have to think a lot of Nikola Tesla. Mm. Uh, you talked about Einstein, uh, you talked about that science is developing actually in a more maybe a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, I believe Nikola Tesla had the power to create a very, very nasty weapon. Uh, but that he also realized that human mankind was maybe not ready for it. And I read in, in uh, his biogra biographies that um, there is actually a plan that is uh, that, that a weapon that is more powerful than a nuclear weapon. And the way he... Um, uh, this plan is, is already written, uh, but he distributed um, this plan. He gave parts of the plans to the US, parts to Russia. Uh, so if they would want to develop it, they would have to collaborate, actually, to put these plans together. Um, is... Uh, um, the, the, the field of science you work in, like with space agencies, with uh, quantum physics. Um, how do they view Nikola Tesla oh, right now? Tesla has always been a double-edged sword uh, th throughout his lifetime and certainly posthumously. Uh, Tesla has always been a great inspiration, not as much because of the ex his extraordinary uh, in inventiveness, but also because of his 
uh, ethical and I would say metaphysical approach to, to, to reality. Uh, Tesla had already foreseen the internet uh, back in the 1890s and um, as far as uh, having not, not, not a, uh, a narrow bandwidth, not, not a myopic view of the world as, as uh, many uh, scientific researchers do, he uh, really uh, ran the, the, the gamut as far as uh, his understanding of uh, everything from uh, electromagnetism to uh, biogeochemistry. And he coincidentally wrote uh, a letter to uh, Einstein uh, about um, releasing certain kinds of information. By uh, the way, I can, t I can tell you the recipe of a very uh, terrible <laughs> weapon that he devised. It will not be so easy to achieve, however, uh, it's actually how you can, with very small means, by means of resonance, split the Earth's sphere into two. Because a as we were talking with, with this uh, self-oscillations uh, of any body, Earth has the same kind of self-oscillation, the wave that goes through it. And I think it takes about two hours to this wave to go through um, through our planet, so if you make super strong explosions in resonance with this wave and you keep doing them until it reaches the resonancy, at the end, after enough explosions, this will happen. And Tesla did such um, experiments in New York with resonance by collapsing big buildings and structures. So, uh, however, uh, the interesting thing about Tesla that he was kind of a loner. So Einstein and scientists today, they work in big groups and big institutions. And the whole development of quantum physics was actually like an art movement. It was like, let's mm -hmm. say, a surrealist art movement. It was a small group of people who each knew each other. They had these retreats. They all came together. And the whole uh, mental um, field of ideas came from their interaction with each other, the, all the parts of quantum theory were developed by different people, Heisenberg, Pauli, Einstein, somebody did math, somebody did theory. So Tesla worked absolutely alone, and the first half of his life, he alone was... Alone and with white gloves. Yes, so he was a very <laughs> extrovert, he engaged businesses, he tried to work with uh, kind of this industrial scale, trying to push his inventions to serve humanity, and the second part of his life, he kind of closed up, and maybe indeed he realized that uh, th this kind of uh, technological utopia uh, will maybe bring faster to the demise of human species that may be um, slower, but this is just my conjectures, but this is how his life looks. The last 40 years of his life, he was alone, um, Hermit. Isolated from exactly yeah. and kind isolated of from big science uh, and well, there are many mysteries yeah, about there him. are many mysteries and thankfully, I mean, as as as, as bittersweet as, as the fate of, of Tesla is, I mean, we we know of course that that, that he in, uh, in, invented uh, the technology that we call radio although Marconi got the Nobel Prize for it, and although, um, you know, uh, it, in, in, in the Soviet Union, and for that matter, in Russia to this day, they still think it was Popov that invented so radio. E each country <laughs> has their own inventor. In the States, they think it was Edison. But uh, it was really Tesla way beforehand. It's quite well documented. And many, many upon many other uh, extraordinary inventions. I mean, the, the really sad part about his fate was that Indeed, he wanted to provide um, free electricity wirelessly for the whole world. And J.P. Morgan, as soon as he realized that, that, that that's what Tesla was going to be doing with, uh, with the money that he invested, he shut him down. Mm. But 
where where would we be without uh, renegades and eccentrics and you know that that's that's really where i think the, the the core of science lies and you know of course we have to we have to connect and we have to uh, establish a certain degree of of collectivity but but we we, we shouldn't compromise the, the most radical ideas but uh, people like tesla and buckminster fuller and some visionaries they were already in the beginning of 20th century very much against uh, such things as use of atomic energy because it's like burning our earth it's like burning the equipment that we have mm. so if we uh, dissolve all the matter on electrons and photons here you know, what, what are we left with? So both Tesla, Buckminster Fuller, they, and Einstein, they considered the use of atomic energy unacceptable on our planet. It's done on stars, but that's why Yeah, stars, but very differently on stars. We're talking yeah, about fusion and not fission. Exactly. Something that we cannot yet control but here on planet. Let's Earth. say Buckminster Fuller, he was against both fusion and fission happening on our planet because it's not compatible with biosphere. And Tesla wrote letters to Einstein about this, and Einstein eventually condemned the use of um, atomic energy on our planet. Buckminster Fuller condemned the use of uh, fossil fuels, that it's, it's like our savings account of our planet. We cannot use it every day. Every day we have to use the energy that comes from the universe continuously, such as gravitational energy, wind energy, solar energy, and we have plenty of this. In and just 30 minutes, the sun emits enough energy for the Earth to... Uh, to flourish over the course of an entire year in terms of the yeah, energy. Yeah, but humanity uses... You can't make money of the sun. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, the sun has powered life and evolution on Earth for a very long time. So, um, yeah, it's a... It's a mm. You know, he has, uh, uh, he has been nominated, Nikola Tesla, for the uh, Nobel Prize, but he never won it. So maybe we just write a letter to the Nobel Prize Committee and ask to give a post-mortem <laughs> Nobel Prize. You get one million dollars and you can put that in further research in how to advancing humanity and rising consciousness. Um, one uh, more question I would like to ask you. Um, with all this scientific, scientific uh, innovation or, or advancement of technology, this exponential growth of, uh, of computers and, and uh, machines. Um, there are two directions of thinking, like it's getting us further as humanity or it will be the end of humanity. Which side are you? We were born in a country that no longer exists in the Soviet Union where uh, utopia simply flows through our veins. We, we don't think that, that it's worth uh, joining the dark side. <laughs> Sorry, on the side of the light. <laughs> Great. But uh, of course, we we are for. I mean, uh, the um, taking the space of uh, biological machines that are so efficient and effective in using solar energy, and putting what we are so proud to call artificial intelligence computers that are today extremely primitive and... In comparison uh, to natural stupidity, you mean? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you have to take this cosmic perspective where in the, uh, many, many parsecs around there is no biological life and we have confirmed this and that's the real treasure that we have to... Um, it's not, it's not the machines. The machines are good in space, exploring other planets where the human being cannot go. And indeed, we work a lot with uh, space agency mm -hmm. and um, uh, since, of and as a person raised in the Soviet Union, the whole mythology of space was so huge. It's, it's part of uh, my consciousness. It's part of like the first humans in space. and. As soon as humans were sent in space and to the moon, now it's more and more robotics. Because what people found out by sending stuff in space, that you cannot send humans in space. It's just impossible. You have to send the whole ecosystem. So in order to support a human in space, 
for one day, you have to have like 30 kilograms of resources, water, air, air different things. And in the Earth, everything is recycled. It's a metabolic organism. So they are working on this Melissa project for many, many years that was started in the Rus by the Russians in the 70s to have this minimal ecosystem of five organisms, mm. uh, a bacteria, an algae, a human being, a plant, that would metabolize each other um, products of um, illumination as resources because there is, there no, is waste. no waste. There is no waste in the universe. There are only unused resources. And they've been breaking their brains on this problem and it's, they're still nowhere. They still cannot figure out this minimal ecosystem. Uh, and the whole European Space Station project where people live in space for six months is trying to figure out how to create this minimal ecosystem. And so far, you just have to send su super expensive loads mm. of resources. Uh, and now all the space missions are robotics. And robotics is extremely successful in space. So for me, the value of the space program uh, and the space, the humanity going into space is we're getting a totally new perspective on life on Earth mm. and how fragilities and that we, we cannot uh, there is no way we can survive alone, and it's actually all about bacteria and photosynthetic bacteria and photosynthetic organisms. They are the real... Um, they're the ones taking advantage of the They are the life in mm. the universe, not us. Well, I mean, there is a, a big ideological kind of motivation on your side, but on the other hand, there's also commercial space travel. Uh, like what SpaceX is doing and, and uh, Elon Musk, uh, who stole the name of Tesla, by the way. Um, mm. But um, 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 is, isn't that something completely different? Their quest to go to space and to start space tourism and start, I it's don't know, mining. It's mostly advertising and marketing. Space tourism, mining of uh, minerals. We, it's in, the old on thinking. The moon, yeah. Um, there is the, the movement of cosmism that came from Russian philosophy in the 19th century. Before there were Sputniks, before people went to space, there were already a few visionaries that looked at life, mm. on biological life, as this cosmic phenomenon. And uh, For that matter, even the word Sputnik was coined not by any scientist, but by an artist, by Kazimir Malevich. And I think that we, we have mm. to become more of cosmists and not space tourists. There are enough tourists on Earth. I mean, why, why bring them into space? But there is also enough space on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> like and look, we're look, already look on at, a spaceship. Look at Canada. Look at <laughs> the bottom of the ocean. It still looks much nicer than this horrible Mars. But, you know, I'm not against space exploration. It's a fascinating, it's, it's a fascinating um, area that gives us a much bigger perspective of who we are, where we are, and how uh, careful we should be with all this intelligence and uh, life that is so complex that it actually originated not as chemical reactions on the surface of our planet. It originated in the depths of black holes and inside of the stars, and that's our history. So you work a lot with the European Space Agency. Uh, I know well, they're very happy because you also <laughs> teach at the Art Science Faculty of the Royal Academy in The Hague, the Netherlands. Um, when is your next... Uh, when are you going up? <laughs> when are you leaving us? Well, coincidentally, uh, for insiders uh, at uh, the European Space Agency, they, they do give you a very special discount for... Um, your, for at least a trip in, 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 into, into orbit, uh, something, something on the order of uh, 10,000 euros, so much, much cheaper than, uh, the, than, than SpaceX or any of these uh, enterprises in the uh, yeah. United States. As an artist, you can uh, experience um, zero gravity in these parabolic flights, which Dimitri and myself were never fortunate enough to experience, although I uh, jumped with a parachute in uh, Belarus and I experienced uh, 
little dive in a very small airplane, but for 40 seconds, 30 seconds, I experienced zero gravity, which was some of the most amazing body experiences I had in my life. And it feels like your body is kind of sucked out and you become uh, bodiless and extremely euphoric. I cannot, I cannot describe it. It's really a very, very profound experience. Mm -hmm. But in the Star City and in Europe, there are programs inside of these parabolic flights where Sci uh, scientists and artists can do these experiments, artworks in zero gravity, just flying on an airplane in our own atmosphere. Of course, before they start sending artists in space, maybe Dmitry and I will not survive, but maybe we will. And uh, space agency is also interested to involve not only engineers and scientists in the exploration of space, but also involve um, designers, architects, artists, uh, people from humanities, philosophers, poets, to, to have a more comprehensive picture, because they still use this word space colonization. Mm. You know, if today on any art conference you use the word colonization, you will be expelled. And yeah. <laughs> we're all trying to get rid of our um, colonizator frame of mind. But uh, this is what is still used in space research by engineers. So they, they are open, they are open. But to come and work for, with them, you have to study. It's, you know, they, they will not accept you just if you're willing to do so. You have to have the knowledge, the skills, and extreme motivation. And these people work on the edge of their abilities. They really create impossible things. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the impossible, if you can come up with an artwork that weighs less than one gram, you have a chance of uh, having it uh, displayed on the International Space Station and elsewhere beyond the Earth's orbit. You know about this project of 25 years of sonar, the 25th anniversary? Mm -hmm. The audio frequencies that are being sent to an exoplanet? Ah. That... Um, uh, in June, we will all see the result in, in Barcelona at the Sonar Festival. Um, they sent, uh, they invited, I think, 25 artists, musicians, um, to compose music uh, that, uh, I think, samples of one minute that are being coded and sent into uh, space. Sounds like the Voyager revisited. But you got some news from the Voyager just I the other day. I read something yeah, that, that was uh, really extraordinary. There was after, what was it, 37 years of... Uh, 37 years and some 30 uh, billion... Light years away. Light years away. There was a, a signal coming back from Voyager 1. Yeah, um, yeah so today I think we heard a lot of um, different approaches from artists. Some are working with technology, hacking this technology. Um, Evelina and Dimitri here, are, I think, are not too much interested in that field, but are more coming from, like, what is this, the, the big question of... Right, hacking reality. Hacking reality. That's which, is, which is quantum reality, of course, what, what you perceive around you is, is, uh, is, is a, uh, a figment of that much uh, larger and stranger uh, physicality. Well. Um, on behalf of uh, Sonar Plus D, I really thank you for uh, coming to Istanbul and perform here uh, today. And uh, it was a pleasure uh, being with you on stage, uh, sharing some of your knowledge and experiences. Um, are there any questions from the room that you would like to ask to Evelina or Dimitri? I think it was very clear. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.